morning everyone this is professor sujata sharma on behalf of bio footprints which is a society which is meant to popularize and promote science and with me i have a very very special and honorable guest professor ashutosh sharma definitely he needs no introduction in fact i would say that the agencies and the organizations that he has headed are known more because of him rather than the other way around he is uh, a wonderful human being of course first and he's been the most dynamic and popular dsc secretary and he's a brilliant innovator and scientist so thank you dr ashutosh for joining us here thank you sujata uh, it's so great to meet today it's a sunday it's a lovely day if you look outside sun shining all its brightness so it's a fantastic day to have this conversation yes of course so uh, ashutosh let's begin uh, with the the early influences that you had in your life uh, which induced you probably or sparked uh, something inside you to follow this career okay let me talk about the influences which i uh, now if i were to look back uh, i consider important in shaping my thoughts and life later um, they may not be directly related to my career but basically Uh, you know how we look at the world and uh, you know that in some ways determines our career and life my okay. earliest memory is um, uh, basically uh, going to about seven different cities with my family with my father okay we got transferred every now and then uh, which means changing seven schools uh, in uh, 11 years of schooling and two uh, more schools before that so essentially what it mean it means that you meet people every couple of years uh, who speak different languages who dress differently who eat differently yeah. who may have a different world view so basically negotiating diversity and okay. having a healthy respect through understanding for that diversity that okay. doesn't come very easily uh, and as we all know it is uh, the diversity uh, is about its linguistics it is about gender sometimes i would be in a coed school sometimes not boys school sometimes in uh, one kind of board sometimes in english medium hindi medium uh, you know all of that so so is the geographic diversity it is gender it is linguistics uh, everything and, and i think that's a very very valuable lesson that you know your mind is not fossilized okay. in one of the ways of looking at the world Uh, the second very uh, very compelling influence i can recall that i was living with my grandfather for a couple of years uh, and i started reading mahabharat uh, the full set in 10 volumes of so geeta press gorakhpur at the age of about 7 and by the age of 10 i had read all of them two or three times uh, really very deeply and you can imagine that this would fire up the imagination of a young mind now what is so great about mahabharat of course that these are great stories and they are told uh, uh, in a very engaging in a very entertaining way uh, but at the same time you see that this is even a more diverse world than the one that you would encounter in reality it's got everything uh, you know from demons to to devas to humans uh, to serpents to uh, you know any kind of diversity even in science fiction Uh, oh. that you can imagine and it introduces to you not just different kind of people but different kind of events and how do people actually react uh, to these events uh, uh, actually a uh, little bit later when i were to read mahabharat again mahabharat is all about dharma uh, so the underlying uh, theme of mahabharat is actually dharma not in the sense of a religion or a sect but dharma is that underlying order that makes everything possible uh, and so you know to a, a deep understanding of that aspect is so so important for any young mind so these i would uh, uh, say were the defining characteristics that i so remember and so value uh, in my life um there are of course many different things reading books uh, i used to read uh, one book a day uh, there were days uh, you know starting maybe fifth standard or so all the way you know you would borrow books you would steal books you would rent books you would exchange books but by hook or by crook uh, you would read a book a day 
uh, and we, uh, you know there was the Russian literature, there was the international literature. I read a lot of Hemingway and stuff. Uh, there was uh, the Bengali literature. There was literature from South, of course, uh, the usual stuff from the North, and um, uh, including a lot of uh, detective novels and so on. Uh, so uh, that you know, of course, reading books, I understand nowadays is not very fashionable, or you know, there are not enough opportunities to do that. And we learn from other media. So that's not really an issue. Of course, translating something like Mahabharat into a visual medium is a nearly destroys it. So that there is some value in reading books. Absolutely. I agree with that. Absolutely. And um, as far as I have known you, Ashutosh, I do feel that uh, you have been a kind of a unconventional person. And uh, if you were to address the younger generation, then uh, what is the unconventional um, kind of advice that you would give them? Uh, what I mean is that everybody gets those conventional advices. So which is the conventional advice that you would probably disagree with? So I actually, I don't uh, agree or disagree because uh, advice is conventional or otherwise. So we must first understand that, uh, of course, advice is always from the viewpoint of someone who is advising and his or her experiences and expectations and worldview, which is perfectly okay. Of course, one may consider conventional advice or unconventional advice. Uh, the point is you, you hear out everything, uh, then uh, it is your analysis of that advice is what matters. It doesn't matter if it's conventional, conventional advice could be good. Uh, it, you know, or it, it may, it's not a question of good or bad. Uh, let me say it differently. Uh, so it's a question of, uh, you know, your life and, and your life expectations matching with that advice. And that comes from your own analysis uh, of uh, all the evidence, all the experiences, uh, all the knowledge and information that you carry with you. So uh, you can neither follow an advice because it's conventional blindly or, you know, reject everything which appears to be conventional. Uh, uh, see, conventional advice simply means that a whole lot of people uh, actually follow that kind of advice. Right. But, uh, and which, which can be a, a good uh, formula in many cases, uh, except that, uh, you know, everybody is also unique. Uh, and so that individuality has to be factored in and that's factored in, uh, you know, by doing your own analysis of the problem. Right. And uh, which do you think is the best career uh, decision that you have ever taken? Oh, so, okay, uh, best career decision. Well, okay, one thing I had decided rather early on in my high school days, or even before that, is that I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, now, why I wanted to be a teacher is because I thought it gives you flexibility, which is not offered by other professions. It, it, uh, it, it uh, you, you can determine your growth trajectory in life, uh, not necessarily listening to a boss all the time and saying, look, do this, do that. Uh, okay, that's one aspect. And of course, that, you know, this is a knowledge sector. Uh, so, in other words, I, I had interest in learning. Uh, so I must learn something every day. Uh, and this is a prof profession that allows you that. Uh, second thing I did, uh, that I, had, I was doing my master's uh, in, a, in, a, in a famous university, after which I had uh, in the US, after which I had uh, half a dozen other uh, offers to join what is called the top 10 universities. Okay. But, but um, there was a particular researcher uh, in a university which was not in the top 10, but I wanted to work in that particular area with that particular professor. So I took the risk, despite everybody saying, look, uh, you know, why do you want to go to that university? Go, you know, X, Y, Z, right? Then most people, I think, would just take that. Uh, my advice in that matter, rather analysis, uh, is that if we don't, we have not done the analysis, if we don't know sufficiently, is best to go with what everybody says. Okay. But on the other hand, if you are clear uh, about your goals, about your preferences, about your strengths, about your weaknesses, then really there would not be no option. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the options would just narrow down and it would become clear that this is what you need to do. 
So I, I went and, uh, you know, I again needed freedom to do my own work. And this professor said, well, you can do everything, which is interesting. No strings attached. You can work in anything from atoms to astrophysics. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, I, uh, later on, this professor became very well known. Uh, yeah. but, but I was an early scout uh, of that profit, if you would, you know, say that. So I think this was, I think this was a great decision that I made. Uh, yeah, despite Paris. what people said to choose a particular school, a graduate school and a particular mentor uh, to do my PhD, uh, even though it looked like that, you know, it doesn't carry the same prestige tag uh, that, you know, some other university may carry. Finally, it is what you do in life that is important. Uh, it is what you make of the opportunity. Uh, uh, to my mind, being an average person uh, in the top place is not as good as being, uh, you know, being the top person, at least be satisfied with what you are doing uh, in any place uh, for that matter. Uh, the second decision that I would say uh, was very good for me. Oh, by the way, anything I'm saying is not a general advice. It's not a universal advice uh, because like I said, uh, everybody is unique and you have to look at your own analysis uh, of the problem. Uh, so I'm just telling you my own thinking about these things. I don't want anybody to be influenced uh, by that. Uh, second thing, okay, I said that I, I decided early on, uh, even before going to US, that I wanted to work in India. Uh, so that was very clear to me. Uh, in fact, you know, I, uh, I got married when uh, in my first year of PhD, which was also rather unusual uh, in those days. Um, but I had made it clear uh, to my then um, girlfriend, wife, that look, our future together would be in India. So if you're going to marry, if you're going to get married, and our expectation is that we would live happily ever after uh, in uh, you know greener pastures, that is not going to happen. Because you see, if you are clear and, and you know, everybody, it influences, you, you know, your decision influence a lot of people. Right. They should also be clear about it, else there would be conflict uh, mm -hmm. later on. Uh, and so I think it worked out very well for me. Uh, why did I want to be in India? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, right. Uh, what was the analysis of this problem? Mm -hmm. The analysis, uh, one of them, you see, uh, is uh, you you can be a, a very good cog in a well oiled machine called wheel right uh, you would do very well indeed uh, yeah. because a whole lot of uh, you know how we are successful or not depends not only on us but it depends on our surroundings and our circumstances and opportunities which are offered so there is absolutely no doubt that that all of that for professional growth uh, may have been better somewhere else uh, especially in the days of 90s, the decade of 90s, 80s, and a little bit beyond that, uh, you know, those opportunities may have been more attractive elsewhere. But uh, the whole point I was saying is that while there are, um, uh, you know, uh, more opportunities for professional growth somewhere else, really all the challenges are in India uh, because it may not be a well-oiled machine, uh, which only means that you have to struggle harder which only means that, you know, that you're alive uh, to the opportunities and challenges all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, one cannot do sleepwalking. One mm -hmm. cannot do sleepwalking in India even while driving right. uh, or, or, or sleep driving, so to say. It's like mm -hmm. playing a video game. And so the life, in a sense, is more challenging. Yeah. Uh, it is more colorful. Uh, it is socially more engaging and meaningful. So you see, as you progress with the years of your life, uh, it's not only roti, kapda, makan that matter. They certainly matter. Yeah. Uh, of course, all of us must have that uh, in sufficient quantity. But as you progress, you also look at other aspects which are related to mind, mm -hmm. which is your satisfaction, which is your fulfillment. Right. Uh, and all of that, a whole lot of that comes by uh, doing a lot of struggles. There's nothing wrong with the struggles at all. Uh, and and they teach us new things. Uh, and certainly it's been, a, uh, you know, so, so because you're talking about decisions hmm. and I think everybody, all my friends in the US, they said, hey, you're not going back, right? Are you? They never believed me. Hmm. I showed them the airline ticket. Yeah. I said, I'm going next week. That's when they <laughs> took me seriously. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> yeah, I was an assistant professor there for a couple of years before returning to India. Okay. That is actually so inspiring. You know, I am. I also took the decision of staying in India and I'm so happy to hear your thoughts, uh, you know, because I have never, uh, never heard anybody putting it in this kind of a way, you know, and this is really inspiring, I'm sure, for the young generation out there. And Ashutosh, I would like to also ask you one thing. I've seen um, that you are a very um, uh, inspiring person. Everybody uh, tends to just gravitate towards you. And uh, they uh, give you so many compliments. They are, uh, you know, you are like a guiding light for many people. And I want to know how you remain grounded, you know, despite all this admiration coming your way. I've seen that you remain absolutely grounded. So how do you manage that uh, form of self-awareness? I, uh, well, okay. I mean, I have had, I have attracted attention since uh, very long. Uh, I was also number two in uh, high school in my board exam. Uh, you know, not, not just in the school, but in the board. I didn't try very, ha very hard, or I should have been number one. But anyways, uh, the point is, I see, learn. Uh, you see that this is some of the things that all of us do. Uh, right. So uh, I recognize uh, weakness as a weakness by examining it in myself. Uh, and there's nothing wrong in people saying, you know, giving compliments and stuff. Uh, I like to return those. Uh, I mean, you know, we should not be very stingy uh, with those things. Uh, it is to create a good positive environment around you. Uh, you see, we must appreciate, we must have self-respect, uh, but we must also give that respect to others. Uh, and so you remain grounded. You understand that some of it is basically social customs uh, that, you know, depending on your position, uh, depending on what people consider your achievements and so on, uh, you know, that happens. Of course, a whole lot, of, whole lot more happens in our country uh, because we are a little bit more tuned to what I call hero worship. Yeah. Uh, to my mind is all wrong yeah. uh, because everybody got same kind of strengths and weaknesses. Uh, it's just a different permutation combination. Uh, and so we must focus on the good things people have to offer, uh, the service that they do, the experience they may have to share, and so on. But we must not take that as a gospel truth. Yeah. Uh, no matter who that is, whether it's a big guru, whether it is a big uh, anybody, right? It is finally, we must put all of those things to our own analysis. And a dispassionate analysis, if I may add, uh, which is a little bit different from analysis, which is self-centered uh, and motivated. Uh, so uh, this is about having a scientific temper. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a scientific temper, you're not easily taken in by what people say. Uh, you understand their need for it. Uh, you also understand your need uh, to receive some appreciation. And that's the end of it. Uh, and you, in the same measure, you try to provide it to others. Okay. So that's, uh, that's a really good piece of advice. And uh, Ashutosh, um, I know you have done so much. I mean, we all know I, uh, you got so many awards, so many accolades. In fact, I would, when I was looking at the list of your awards, I was wondering which one haven't you got? It's, it was like that. So you've done so much. Uh, tell me, uh, what do you think still remains to be done? So first of all, about, about awards and stuff. Let me tell you, no, no award that one would get, at least in my life, I can see it, will give you any great deal of happiness and satisfaction uh, beyond a day or two. Uh, right. That's about the outer limit of an award or what you can actually get from there. Uh, so having said that, uh, one cannot actually plot and plan uh, for awards. Uh, there would be a, a, you know, a, a totally uh, bad thing to do because then your life gets channeled your right. energy get channeled into, uh, you know, um, just wishing for an award. And for that, maybe other things that need to be done, uh, which are not such nice things to be done. Okay. And people just, you know, kind of waste. And imagine if you are plotting for an award for a very long time and you do not get it, what right. happens then? I mean that, you know, that all your energies actually decay very fast uh, because having lost the objective for which one has been working. Uh, you know, that life suddenly looks meaningless. Uh, so that ought not to never happen, I hope. 
uh, with anybody. Um, uh, now uh, you were saying what remains to be done. Uh, I have not thought in those terms uh, about you know. So certainly uh, there is no no end to awards. There is no end to achievements. There is no end to money and everything else and fame that people seek. So in that sense, something always remains. Uh, the point is, do you take that very seriously? Uh, are you going to be upset about it? Uh, certainly not. Uh, I mean, so tomorrow is another day and something remains undone. Uh, we take care of that and move on from there. Right. Uh, it is about living, not plotting for a very long future uh, and, and, you know, that kind of stuff. But it's about, um, it's about you know, th this is actually a cliche, but mm. let me repeat anyways. Uh, is about living in the present. Absolutely. Uh, it's very hard to live in the present because present is also uh, not there. It's all our memory that it's we live in. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is a question which I have, uh, and I want to ask you this question, that uh, science is uh, nowadays looked uh, at most scientists in such a way that it is boxed into um, categories like impact factor, H index, um, first author, last author, etc. What are your thoughts about this? So uh, certainly there have been rise of indices. Uh, you see, there's an old saying: say that what you cannot quantify, mm -hmm. uh, you cannot understand and change. Right. So there is some truth in that. So now let's move away from the extreme positions. So when this kind of question is posed. People, you know, take extreme positions. Huh. Uh, you know, some say, look, okay, you know, what you cannot quantify, how do I know what it means? Right. Others say, look, uh, look at the contents, look at the quality, judge them, dive deeply into that, look at that kind of impact and so on. Okay. Uh, so both of these views actually hold some merit. Hmm. Uh, my own approach in this matter uh, is that we must collect all the data and indicators which are available. Huh. Now, I'm not saying that we base all our decisions only on that. What it means is that that provides me uh, something to build upon. Okay. Now, if I look at a number, I say, look, is, that number seemed correct to me. Uh, let me now look at uh, all the research that has been done. Uh, hmm. What is the novelty? If I could judge that, okay. Of course, now everybody can judge everything. Absolutely. Because there are super specialists and everything, right? So, but if I could, then I would go a little bit deeply into it and say, okay, this number, is that a true reflection, I think, of the work that has been done? Could it? Could this number be a false positive? Uh, could this number be a false negative? Uh, in either of the two cases, I must carry out the analysis a little bit farther than the numbers uh, and then be able to show at least in a little objective way, right. not simply because I'm saying it. Um, okay, because I may be saying it because of my own reasons and my selfish reasons, because I like somebody or I don't like somebody else, you know, that to, to remove that kind of bias from absolutely. the numbers, I must be able to demonstrate as to for what reason I think that um, these numbers are exaggerated. They are not true representation of the research. Or, or that the numbers might look low, but real impact of that research and the novelty and creativity and so on, those elements uh, mm -hmm. of the research are more meaningful than shown by the numbers. So you see, it's not a very simple thing. Unfortunately, yeah. uh, communities take a very narrow view of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, fact is that we are not experts in everything. Fact is that we don't have that much time and interest and commitment uh, to do all of this, which is required. So in the absence of that, the numbers and the indices uh, and the matrices, they become a surrogate uh, for what we actually need to do. Absolutely. That's absolutely a very balanced view. And uh, finally, Ashutosh, uh, this is uh, on a lighter note. If you did not know your actual age, what age do you think you would be? If you had to just guess, based on your uh, you know state of mind, yeah. No, that, that's very true, Sujata, what you said, actually, if you think about age or time for that matter, there, there is an age by, uh, the, you know, biological age by body. Uh, there is an age by clock, the chronological time. 
there is an age as you said by experiences mm -hmm. and there is also an age by mind Absolutely. these are all different ages uh okay so what age do i feel actually i don't feel a fixed age uh, okay. it depends okay. on the context uh, right. if i am okay. i'm if i'm visiting roman ruins i'm 2000 years old okay if i am visiting okay. lothal i am 4000 years old oh. uh, if i'm talking to a 5 year old i am that age okay uh, and uh, so but of course when i'm having pain in my joints <laughs> then <laughs> then i am my bodily age absolutely okay that's and that's... if i retire then i know i am 60 <laughs> so okay my chronological age so you see age is not a fixed concept at all and one should never make uh, that mistake of thinking that one has a fixed age right. uh, that puts constraints we put constraints on ourselves on our mind uh, which is actually ageless absolutely yeah so ashutosh it's been so wonderful talking to you i really uh, lost the track of time and i still have so many more questions so i do feel we must have a part 2 of this and Absolutely. Uh, i would love to invite you again and uh, in, the, in maybe some few days and would love to have you over again with uh, a set of more questions which i still have uh, written down here i haven't asked you because time is short thank you so much i seriously am feeling very enlightened and very uh, very inspired no thank you very much how about we switch places next time and i do the easier job you answer the questions <laughs> uh, wonderful wonderful we'll do that yes yeah, thanks great. thank you bye bye